Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar that is hosted by Granted, which is a joint project of Jewish Funders Network and Upstart. Granted works to strengthen relationships between grant makers and grant seekers in the Jewish community through webinars like this, small facilitated conversations, and a resource hub. And I would like to encourage all of you to check out our resource, resource hub, jgranted.org, after today's program. Today's topic is on how to best prepare for an evaluation as a grant maker or grant seeker. This webinar will provide concrete tools, tips and tricks for both grant seekers and grant makers to transparently share information, discuss challenges, and create a plan for the most impact. After the webinar, we will share the tool that we are discussing today to help support your work. And at the end of the program, we will have time for Q&A. So I would like to encourage you to use a Q&A box at the bottom of your throughout their presentations today. We are fortunate to be joined today by three wonderful presenters to share their knowledge and experience, experiences. First is Dr. Wendy Rossov, founder and principal of Rossov Consulting. Mike Boberg, director of impact assessment of Jewish Foundations of Cincinnati. And Marie Krulowicz Brown, executive uh, and artistic director of Ish. And now we will get started with Dr. Wendy Rossov. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you, Tamar, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, Brian, can we go ahead and start the uh, screen share? Thank you. Okay, as Tamar mentioned, uh, today's session is about uh, how to prepare for an evaluation. And uh, we're gonna be talking about um, the four questions and sort of how to, how to walk through this, uh, this tool that will be available to you on the GrantEd uh, resource uh, hub. A successful evaluation effort depends on strong grant seeker, grant maker alignment. When both parties see the value in the data being collected and can learn from it, the likelihood increases that an evaluation's findings will be actionable. But how best to achieve that alignment? This is what the uh, tool that we've developed and that we'll be talking about today focuses on. We think that uh, there are four essential questions uh, that need to be answered in, prep in preparing for an evaluation uh, effort. And uh, these four questions are really essential to the success of, of any of those efforts. We're gonna be uh, talking about those four questions, but I will uh, preview them right now. Who are the audiences uh, for the evaluation? What do they uh, wanna know? How will they use the information? And what represents valid and credible and reliable data? And I'm gonna go into each of those questions in just a moment. These four questions are essential for both the grant maker and the grant seeker to answer about any evaluation process. And then there's a critical step that has to happen next. Both parties, the grant maker and the grant seeker ought to think about these four questions and answer those questions for themselves. Once they do, the critical step is that they need to meet and talk about their answers and their perspectives and their views on these four questions. And through that conversation, which can sometimes be facilitated by an external third-party evaluator, or can just be uh, you know, facilitated between the two of them by them, uh, it's really in that conversation that, um, that allows for transparency in terms of the goals, the process, the focus, and ultimately the utilization of the evaluation effort that might be undertaken. So let's dive a little bit uh, more into both the four questions and the process itself. So as I mentioned, uh, these are the four questions that ought to be considered by both grant makers and grant seekers as you approach any evaluation effort. So the first one is, who are the audiences for the evaluation or the learning effort that you're going to undertake? And in this question, you might think and imagine to yourself, imagine that the evaluation is complete. Who would you wanna send it to? Who would you wanna share it with? Who would you wanna make sure that the results are uh, shared with, uh, that, that the, whatever report is issued is read uh, by? Um, who might you want to have a conversation with about it? 
who might potentially use the findings from the evaluation beyond just the grant maker and the grant seeker? Who would you hope would use it? Thinking through all of those questions and all of the potential audiences for the evaluation work is really critical, uh, is really a critical question uh, in this process. The second question is, what do these different audiences uh, want to learn from this process? Um, to plan successfully for an evaluation, the specific, um, the specific methods uh, need to be secondary to the core learning questions. Oftentimes when people think about an evaluation, they'll start with something like, let's survey the participants or let's interview them or let's observe a program. Those are methods, those are how information will be gathered. But what information needs to be gathered? What are the core learning questions really need to precede the question of how will data be gathered? In our work at Rosoft Consulting, helping grant makers and grant seekers define their learning questions, we have often found that there needs to be some conceptual work to unpack and understand the terms and language used in these questions. I'll give you a quick example and then I'm gonna move on to the third of our four questions that need to be considered. For example, if a program is meant to quote unquote, help young people strengthen their Jewish identity, there should be a conversation between the grant maker and the grant seeker around what does Jewish identity mean for this particular program or intervention that uh, is about to undergo some evaluation or learning effort. Um, possible answers to even a question this seemingly simple might include connection to Israel, love of volunteerism and social justice, engagement in Jewish life, enhancing sense of Jewish values, and a whole host of other things. So getting clear about um, what people want to learn and, and, and even getting more specific about some of that terminology is really critical at this stage in the process. The third question to consider in any kind of uh, planning effort for evaluation is how will the information be used once it is obtained? Everyone involved in planning and executing an evaluation effort needs to understand what is at stake. How will the information that is gathered and reported on be used? It's really critical in this question to go into the effort with openness to the possibility of difficult findings. Discuss in advance the implications for each party. What are the stakes in this evaluation effort for you? What happens for you as a grant maker or a grant seeker? If the news is good, if the news is less good, if the learnings are not what you expected, or even if it's everything that you had hoped for, knowing in advance how you're gonna use this information is a really critical step in this process. And finally, the fourth question, and you can, I hope you can start to see how all of these questions sort of iterate on themselves and they're all connected to each other, even though we're presenting them in a sequential framework. The fourth question is, what kinds of data are gonna be valid and credible to whom? Everyone has their own opinion about what constitutes data. For some, testimonials and stories can be really meaningful and powerful, serving as what we would call qualitative data. Others may want, quote unquote, hard facts or numbers, which are usually quantitative in nature. The question about what represents valid and credible data to whom is important because you don't want the evaluation learnings to be dismissed by any audience on a technicality because you didn't include certain groups of people who may be essential because the data weren't gathered in a particular way, because the type of data gathered weren't seen afterward as credible or valid to certain audiences. So this is really a critical step. It's like a jury hearing and all of a sudden, you know, the, the real issue isn't addressed because, uh, because the case gets dismissed on a technicality. That's what we want to avoid here by considering this fourth question. And then we get into the process. So as we mentioned, 
we think, we believe that for an evaluation effort to be successful and the best way to prepare for evaluation is for both grant makers and grant seekers to answer these four questions first for themselves. They should look at the four questions in this toolkit and take time separately with their staff, with key stakeholders who might include board, it might include uh, others um, in their organizations to answer uh, these questions. Um, when, when you see the tool itself on the grant ed website, you'll see that there's worksheet pages such as this, or there's also an online Miro board template that you can use um, in this process. After these questions have been answered by both parties independently, the next piece is the conversation. The grant maker and grant seeker should then meet to compare and contrast responses. And this meeting can be facilitated or supported by the evaluator who's going to be doing the work if desired. This step is really critical, as it says on the slide. The conversation between the grant maker and the grant seeker at this point in and of itself can be and often is a, a moment for learning and growth. The questions that might be considered in this conversation, and this is the last piece that I'll share, include the following. And of course, there are other questions, but these are the kinds of questions that we as third-party evaluators might facilitate uh, around grant makers and grant seekers with regard to evaluation. Um, are there areas of shared interest uh, that could be leveraged uh, in the evaluation design? Are there questions that um, the grant makers are most interested in that are very different than what the grant seekers or the grant head already are interested in? Uh, it's not just grant seekers, but also those who, who have already received grants and are in that grant maker, grant recipient relationship. How can common ground be found? And frankly, if there's not common ground with differences of opinion, how can decisions be made about whether certain things will or will not be included in the evaluation effort in the end of the day? What are the implications if the findings are difficult for both parties? How might uh, the grant maker and or the grant seeker respond to those difficult findings? What are its, what's at stake? And we talked about that earlier in those, in those four questions, but this is a time to really have that conversation. Um, another really important piece of this conversation is, are there important inflection points along the way where data might be shared, where meaning might be made together um, in advance of the final report being issued? And finally, uh, what kinds of communications processes might there be around evaluation? Um, how hands-on does the grant maker want to be? Who's responsible for making decisions? Who's responsible for troubleshooting during the process? Um, these are just a few questions for consideration in that important converse conversation. Thank you. Um, that's, that's essentially the tool in essence, the, the, the piece that happens sort of after, after all of this important work in terms of planning for an evaluation is then of course, actually scoping the project uh, with an evaluator and then going forward and carrying out uh, the project. So I'm gonna hand it over to, uh, to our colleagues, uh, Mike Boberg at the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati and Marie Krulwich Brown uh, who is the executive and artistic director of ISH um, in Cincinnati, uh, grant maker and grant seeker or grant ed already, a grant recipient, uh, who have used this tool and are now going to share a little bit about their experience. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wendy. Um, again, my name is Mike Boberg. I'm director of impact assessment at the Jewish Foundation. And in the link that you'll get at the end, um, you will see an example of a completed set of these questions that the foundation and the team over at ISH um, participated in and, and created. I, I wanted to add some context as to what this is all about. And so you'll have a clear understanding of when Marie and I are bouncing things back and forth between each other, what it is we're actually talking about. Um, some of you may be familiar with the TEEN initiative, which is a, a national 
um, funded model that Jim Joseph has found partners in about a dozen cities around the country um, in an effort to increase teen engagement on the ground in those markets. Um, back in 2018 or so, um, the foundation in Cincinnati was tapped to be one of their funding partners. So we helped fund the launch of the teen initiative here in town. And at the end of 2020, um, we found ourselves looking for uh, a new partner to sort of run things on the ground in Cincinnati. And we went through a process and Ish uh, and our friend Marie uh, were the, the team that we decided was going to be our boots on the ground uh, for the teen initiative. So when we're discussing sort of how we address these questions and how we answered them and where we aligned, we're really talking about our efforts along the teen engagement front. Uh, in particular, uh, given that it's funded in part by Jim Joseph, there are other funders involved besides us. So I just wanted to point that out. Marie, did you have anything else to add before we sort of jump in? I think that's perfect. Thanks, Mike. Absolutely. Um, so when the foundation took it upon ourselves to sort of work through answering these questions, um, at least in terms of the who, we came up with three distinct audiences. Uh, of course, our foundation trustees, um, they're the ones who made the funding decision to match the Jim Joseph Award. Um, of course, we had very close connections with our teen engagers and teen educators, so we knew they were going to be an audience for us as well. And then the broader field of Jewish teen engagement, as we were part of a national network, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were sharing that as well as our funder, co-funder, Jim Joseph Foundation. So those were our three primary. Um, and then uh, I won't get into much more of the other examples, but Marie, I, I'd love for you to share um, where our lists differed because we had three, but you, uh, the ISH team came back with quite a few more audiences than we had on our list. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. So a lot of the work that ISH does on the ground utilizes design thinking or human-centered design, where we're thinking about different points of view of constituents or you know audiences in our in our sphere who engage with us who you know take advantage of our programs and what what's driving them what's important to them so when ish was thinking about who who our constituents who our audiences are in the case of our learning it really took kind of a robust sphere for example our direct, you know, we would consider one of the most important audiences, our teens. That, that should make sense. Um, they, they should be driving the what we do and the why we do it. Um, but with teens, there are other individuals in their lives who help shape their access to programs and community, and that's parents, guardians, maybe an educator or an adult advisor who would perhaps introduce them to opportunities in community. So then these parents and guardians are another really important stakeholder group. Um, and then furthermore, partners, that's where we really, that was a connection point between ISH and the foundation. We both saw um, incredible value in learning with um, our partner agencies on the ground who are also doing similar or adjacent work. And then, of course, um, being the grantee of the Jewish Foundation, their leadership team, as well as Jim Joseph, again, the context of this national funder collaborative are, are critical stakeholders. And then the last kind of group I think I touched on four. So our last one are really our team. Um, as designers of these initiatives, we really want to make sure that our team are equipped and focusing on the point of view of, again, that, that primary stakeholder audience, and that's our teens. Um, you know, so they, we wanna make sure that our team understands who we're trying to reach, what's influencing their, the team's decision to engage with us or not, who's not being reached in certain programs. And when we understand that, and when we focus on um, those questions and those points of view, it allows us to make different decisions about both the how we go about our work and also the what we do. There's one other aspect of this process that I, I wanted to point out. I, I think Wendy did a really nice job of 
indicating the importance of having that mutual conversation after both sides have sort of responded to these questions. Um, because we're based in Cincinnati and we actually already had a relationship with Ish and the team, um, it made the conversation perhaps easier to have than it might be if you are a, a national or regional funder and you don't already have a strong relationship with the, the grant seeker. Um, and if, if that is the case, I would highly encourage anyone that's thinking of utilizing this tool, if at all possible, given we're still in the middle of a pandemic, but hopefully on the tail end, um, have those meetings in person. Um, I know when we first met with the ISH team to get around a table to sort of talk a lot of this through, I think it's really important to be able to bounce those ideas off of each other, to challenge each other um, in the same space, as opposed to just trying to do something like this via email or, or even remotely on, on Zoom, even though workshops and webinars work great on that front. So um, I just wanted to further that point as well. Um, Marie, I have another question for you, uh, which is um, how, how did you find utilizing this tool? Did it, um, did you feel it was a little bit different or did you feel like you were putting the, the cart before the horse? in terms of traditional evaluation models? And, and how did you all process that from the grantee side? Because this is something that we as the funder brought to you to suggest, you know, hey, we would like to do this together. This is how we like to work our process. Yeah, totally. That's a good question, Mike. Um, you know, I think for us, particularly in the context of our teamwork, it fit really nicely with how we were already thinking about approaching the work before we kind of got into our key activities. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I know you know that we're following a, a design thinking framework and our first step is learning. And so we, we were already immersed with this um, need and idea of, of who do we need to learn from. So I think it was easy, it was very easy for us to identify quickly, of course, our teens, our, our parents' role models, um, and our other agency partners. But then I think it was an important reminder actually um, to make sure that we are thinking about the foundation and Jim Joseph and our team um, in designing our kind of research methods and, and our learning questions so that we don't forget about those really important stakeholders too. So I think it was a good checklist and a good kind of litmus test and I could see us um, coming back to this and, and kind of making sure or, or kind of testing ourselves, where are we at? How, how well are we doing in terms of learning with learning for each of these audience groups? Yeah, the, the one um, audience that you all had identified that was not on our list, which I thought was really important, and I'm glad that you guys brought it to the table, is, is the teens. Um, you know, we do not directly work with the teens. We work more with the organizations where they have the teen engagers. So they, of course, made the, uh, an, an obvious audience for us. But the fact that you are using such an interesting process and the, the teens are so important to the root of how you're um, moving this forward, I thought it was very valuable. And that was one of the standouts that um, when we were first discussing this, I, I was grateful that you were able to bring them to the table and that they're, you're actually sharing the learnings of our evaluation, ongoing evaluation process with the Rosa folks. Um, you know, you're sharing that with them because they're able to then make informed decisions because they're helping to design, as you said, you're using the design think process. Um, really important for them to have that information. So um, thank you for that. I'm curious, uh, given again, um, a lot of times grant seekers don't have an opportunity to ask grant funders many questions. What questions do you have for, for us along this line? Yeah, sure. Um, you maybe touched on this a little bit with what you were just speaking about, but I'm curious um, in this process and, and in our conversation, kind of going through this uh, tool, using this tool together, was there anything that surprised you about 
out of what we shared or what we were thinking about? Uh, yes, actually. Um, and and it, it, beyond just adding the teens as, as one of the primary audiences for uh, sharing our, our research results and evaluation learnings, um, where I think you brought and not so much the who and the what do you want to learn, but it was definitely how you're going to use the information and what represents the, the valid and credible data. Um, specifically, uh, utilizing the data to generate uh, that relational learning community and the idea of capturing the data through your action research. I mean, you are bringing um, elements of evaluation and research to our lexicon, uh, uh, things that we weren't used to doing and, and are now exploring doing in other areas like group level assessments, again, utilizing those design think methods. Um, these were relatively new concepts to us at the foundation. We were much more aligned with those traditional research methodologies. So um, even the platform, um, you know, we've worked with the Rosoft team for a number of years on, on doing annual teen surveys and teen parent surveys and teen engager surveys. And when we, because we had done this process, when we started talking about, okay, we're going to be looking at doing the teen survey, um, you know, your team brought back to us this idea of, you know, oh, well, we don't want to use the traditional survey method. You know, we don't want to send out an email or even send out a text. We want to use this thing called Survey Sparrow. And um, our, our Rosoft consultant, Zohar Rotem, is like, Survey Sparrow. I'm not sure I'm familiar with Survey Sparrow, and and yet the team jumped on it, and it was um, it was a very valuable experience for us to sort of explore new methodologies, and we were able to do it together because of the the answers to your questions as we were sort of designing this up front. It, it was a great experience, um, and I, I think we got a lot from trying new ways of doing things um, just because we're the funder and, and a professional evaluator you know doesn't mean we don't get stuck in our own ways so to have you know a new grant partner sort of nudging us to say hey we think this will be really valuable we think the kids are going to respond to this i thought it was great um, so really thank you for that um, being able to see desired approaches in advance and ask questions about you know, the what, the how, and the why were important to ensure that we were aligned even before we get, uh, began to start the evaluation process. So, um, but it was nice to have you on that end sort of nudging and saying, hey, we want to try something new. We were like, yeah, sure, we can do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really have to give huge credit to my team. Um, I have an incredible team of practitioners, um, experts in this work who care deeply, deeply about the why we do and you know try experiment in the way that we do and and even the what of what we're asking is so important um so i really have to give credit to my team and then i love that you called out zohar and the rossov team and your team might get the foundation um we at ish feel so lucky and so grateful that you were willing but both rossov and the foundation willing to try new things with us, experiment and explore. Um, again, I can appreciate that it's a little different, um, probably a bit for Rossov and the foundation to be kind of shifting your point of view as Ish is doing to the team. Like how, who's really using the tool? How are they using it? How, how are they going to be impacted by even what we're asking? Um, so just kudos to, to you all for being open to kind of trying different approaches. Well, again, I having utilized this tool in advance sort of, I think, positioned both of us to be open to that sort of back and forth dialogue. And, you know, we didn't, it wasn't like we were caught off guard by not having done this where we're expecting one thing and then you come back and say, no, this is what we want to do. This was an iterative process and this allowed us to do that. So. Um, totally. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. I, I think on that note, you know, I have another question for you. Um, we so we we had this great experience of working through this this tool together. We we've got we have great outcomes. Do you see this resource as being static? Um, I'm thinking specifically in the context of our kind of three year grant period. Um, if, if yes or if not, 
um, when would feel appropriate to you of when you might or we might revisit it together and, and what do you think we would what are the choices we'd make or what would we learn from that how would that impact the decision that's a really that's a really good question and um i i view utilizing this tool um more along the lines of sort of using the Waze app, for those of you familiar with Waze, um, if you're in your car, um, as opposed to sort of the old fashioned, you know, foldable map. Um, it's important for us to revisit this. This is a living, in my opinion, this is a living document. Um, the, sure, Helen, the tool that I'm referring to is the, um, the piece that uh, was in Wendy's PowerPoint, and you'll actually receive a link on how to use it. Um, there's there's a version for the grand tour to um, complete, and then the grant seeker to complete. Pretty much the same questions, but you do it separately and then and bring them back together. So that's the tool to which I'm referring. Um, it there are always because this is designed to help us learn, that's what evaluate, at the root of evaluation is learning. There will be things that come up. There will be things that we learn where we might need to double down as a funder and say, yes, this really works. Or um, you guys as the boots on the ground and as the, the grant partner for us might say, you know what, that's not working. We need to rethink that. And and that's what Waze does. You know, if we run into like the traffic jam, we see it coming up ahead, we can work together in advance to figure out what's our best route around this and it still wind up at the same destination. It might take us a little longer to get there, but at the end of the day, we're not stuck. And, and that's where I think this can really come in handy. Um, in, in her opening remarks, Wendy at one point mentioned um, something called meaning making. And as part of our process with the, the Rosan team, um, we have those. So a, a after we run the annual team survey, so you know that's where I'm really engaged in, in all of this is working with the, um, the Rosan team on those annual surveys and, and sort of benchmarking and, and seeing how we're moving the dial on certain fronts. Um, but rather than just come back to us and say, okay, here's the results from this year, we schedule time with them and have what we call meaning making meetings so that we walk through the results together with the ISH team, with the Rosov team and with the foundation team. And we're able to then identify where there are call outs. What does this mean? Given that you know their expertise in having worked on a lot of evaluation for the teen initiatives across the country, you know, how does this align with what other markets are seeing? And it gives us that time to work together uh, at, at that point to change things. So uh, I would definitely say it's a living document. Um, it's something that we will go back to probably as part of our meeting making meetings moving forward and we'll revisit and there may at some point wind up being a new audience that we the foundation that you know if there are new funders that appear on the scene locally maybe we want to add them as a new audience to that so um definitely something that we're going to continue to revisit and, and rework with you guys as we move the the team funding initiative forward so that's awesome that totally makes sense love that so, um do you have anything else for me, Wendy? Should we bring you back? Yeah, bring Wendy back. Do you have questions for us, Wendy? Or uh, I'm, there may be some questions. I've seen some things popping up in the chat, so maybe there are some Sorry, questions out there. Whoops. <laughs> My watch is talking to me. Not right now. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Well, first, Wendy, I want to give you an opportunity now if there's some, some response to anything that was just said. I just want to say I love that idea of meaning-making meetings i think that we should all try to do that all the time i just love that 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 phrase i i think that that's one of my big takeaways i think that's that's great i want to encourage people to write your questions in the chat as as i start asking a few different questions that have already come in i want to ask my colleague to put the tool um the link to the tool in the in in the chat i see that some people have asked for that we did want to distract 
during the presentations, but very happy to share that with you now and we'll send a follow-up email after. And if you open that up now, that might also stir some questions that you can ask our, our panelists. So, so with that, um, it's great to have a little bit of time now to, to digest what we were talking about and to ask some more questions. Uh, so I have a few, if, if none of you have any follow-up I, I have uh, I have two um, follow up comments or thoughts. First of all, Mike and 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 Marie, I really enjoyed listening to the conversation. I know that we we talked about this you know a lot uh, and also you know talked about it in advance of this webinar today. But it was it was really really nice just to hear the the conversation um, back and forth. It's 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 certainly music to our ears. That's for sure. Um, I, I wanted to comment on two things. One is, um, Mike, I think your comment about the prior relationship, right? You guys being um, a local funder, um, you know, working with a local provider with whom you have relationship or in relationship already, um, even though this work in particular into the teen initiative was in sort of an expansion into a new arena uh, for, for, you know, for the for your grant partner uh, for ISH. Um, and and that and that relationship piece, right? So yeah, for for certain national funders or regional funders or people who are you know perhaps um, I would even say first time funders of a new organization that they're not familiar with, right? Um, and and we believe that you know you know this this kind of conversation um, you know is is something that that helps build that relationship, but but there also has to be trust, right, in order to even have a conversation like this. So it's. It's a little chicken and egg and a little tricky, and, and we hope that that having uh, this kind of, of framework for the conversation, um, you know, uh, um, at least allows for or, or or offers a roadmap to get into that kind of relationship and and sort of trust building um, that we think is essential. And I I imagine uh, tomorrow you and your colleagues at JFN and at at, uh, at at upstart and and grant and, and granted you know effort more generally is, is really trying to, to drive toward right which is building that relationship building that trust so I just wanted to reflect on that relationship piece which which I think is really really critical and obviously the 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 trust also the relationship with the evaluator right uh, that might be uh, utilized in this process so um, that I think it's a three way sort of trust triangle uh, as it were. That's, that's just a comment or an observation. The second thing I wanted to offer is um, the beneficiaries, right? Beneficiaries of whatever intervention uh, is being funded and is being explored or learned about through the evaluation. Um, and and Re, you mentioned how important it was to you guys at ISH that whatever learnings are generated through this evaluation effort are shared with the teens themselves, right? They are the ultimately the beneficiaries, you know, of, of the work. Um, certainly the teen professionals, right? The, the people who are working with the teens, but, but in particular the teens. And I would say that, that one of the things that um, is, is, you know, sort of on the cutting edge of philanthropy right now more, more generally is that the beneficiaries themselves might be the if 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 we're talking about a trust triangle between the, the funder and uh, and the and the grant seeker and the grant maker and the evaluator, there may be a fourth. Uh, there may be actually four legs on the stool here, right? Which is the beneficiary. And what should be the beneficiary's role, perhaps, in uh, answering these questions or being involved in this conversation on the front end, right? About um, who are the audiences, and if they're going to be an audience, right? What what do they want to learn about? Um, how will the information, you know, how will they come to learn about the information? How might they use the information, in fact? Uh, and what kinds of data are going to be credible to them, right? So thinking about the beneficiaries also in this process, and I think that that's a that's a that's a growing edge that that we're sort of all entering together, um, you know, in in our sector. Uh, I think that's important. So that's. That's what I would offer in terms of some reflections based on this conversation. Well, I want to quickly go back to Wendy's point earlier about like that trust building. Um, I, I would also argue that it's, it is perhaps even more important for grantees and grantors that already have a relationship to do this because it puts in writing. A lot of times if there's an existing relationship, you walk into these kinds of things thinking you know what the other party is going to do and if you don't use something like this where you put it in writing and discuss it together in advance 
there are assumptions that can also often lead to challenges down the line. So it's really important to, to consider using this. That's great. Thank you, Mike, for that last comment goes into this. One of my first questions here that came in is, how did you use this tool to strengthen your relationship? And maybe you touched upon that a bit, but is there more to talk about in terms of, of how you use this, how this tool helps strengthen the relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, for Ish, you know, I'm glad that Wendy pointed out that our venture, it, while, you know, Ish and the Jewish Foundation Cincinnati had a, a pretty strong relationship going into this particular um, grant opportunity, Ish had not yet endeavored in a, in a big way into teen engagement landscape. And so I think it was important um, and, and validating and strengthening for Ish to be able to share the robust way that we were looking at approaching this work. And again, to be able to have that interactive dialogue with the foundation as partners to, to put into space, hey, we looked at this tool, we're not quite sure it, it's the right tool to use, are you open to looking at something new? Or, hey, we're not sure that these are the right questions to ask, would you be open to shifting some things? That, I mean, that's, there's a risk there for sure. And so I think um, it's, it's important to take risks in work and it's really wonderful and beautiful when we can work through and, and you know, experiment and try something new together. So um, yeah, again, just really grateful for this opportunity. Uh, from the funder's end, uh, you know, our relationship with Ish had really been Marie-centric um, mm. prior to the teen initiative. And so for me, going back to the whole relationship building um, component, um, I really am not working directly with Marie on a lot of this. I'm working with one of her colleagues who I had seen on paper, but I'd never, mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't know her. I don't have a relationship with her. And so working through this process together really helped me gain a level of respect and um, trust in her so that I, I could be comfortable in knowing that, okay, Marie may not be my direct contact for some of this now, but I know that Ali Joe is is going to be able to handle it and we'll work together as we need to. So that was really important too. Great. Thank That's you. Great point. Another question that came in, um, and maybe Wendy will start with you on this and would love to tell us your Maria and Mike's perspective is what if an organization wants to do an evaluation without a specific funder? So we're talking now that we have a, a funder, a grant maker, grant seeker pair, but what about if we don't have that? Great. Um, I, it's a great question, and, and uh, I would say recently, I mean, we we get we get asked this question a lot, so, um, so this is a great one. Uh, you know, there there are often times, especially when an organization is um, either young, new, um, just starting out, or starting out in a sort of a new arena, and uh, may not have a whole lot of um, you know funding support. Um, but they are seeking that ultimately or wanting, wanting that at some point, and they're looking for, um, you know, some proof of concept work early on, which is, you know, sort of a type of evaluation or focus of evaluation, um, wanting to sort of understand themselves or their work and or their beneficiaries uh, better so that they're better able to communicate um, out to potential funders, right? Um, the, 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 the possible efficacy of their work and, and how worthwhile they are uh, to invest in, right, for, for a funder. Um, and so, you know, in those cases, we're, what, we, what we oftentimes suggest, and, and this is a real big, like, leap of faith, and this is, this is hard, so I'm not going to, like, make it Pollyannish, but we, we would suggest actually going to um, some funders that you think you might want to pursue in the future, and saying to them, we, you know, are going to undertake some evaluation work, some learning work, and um, with an eye toward hopefully coming to you at some point for support, right? Obviously, you want to do that with a funder with whom you're aligned, with whom for, for whom your mission appropriate, right? So all of those things I think are important due diligence that um, a grant seeker needs to do on their end. But to go to a potential funder and say, um, you know, we're hoping to come to you in the next year or two as we as we grow, as we develop whatever we think we're mission appropriate in these ways, and we're going to do some learning. Um, here's what we're thinking about learning about and asking about. Um, 
Is there anything in particular that we should be focused on so that when we come to you, we bring data and we bring evidence of, of our efficacy of our proof of concept when the time comes? Now that's that's a that's a big, you know, that's a big ask. Um, but and I mean, I think if, if Grant Ed is successful in, in its work, um, these kinds of conversations, even not just between current grant makers and, and grant recipients, but potential future grant makers and grant recipients uh, can be a piece of this puzzle as well. So that's how I would answer that question tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question that kind of piggybacks on, on that a bit um, about, let me just scroll back to for a moment. So it's related to the third question of the four um, questions in the tool. Um, how will the data be used? Should the partners discuss how the findings will or will not be disseminated to the field in the beginning phase of designing the valuations? Um, and this person mentioned, and I think maybe many people on this on this call feel this, is they find many times many organizations were reluctant to invest in serious evaluation because they're afraid that they will invest heavily and then the report will sit on the shelf and not. Uh, so I, I bring that to the group to to respond to. <laughs> Mike and I are smiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll let you start, Mike. It, it, it certainly can't sit on the shelf. Um, again, at the root of evaluation is learning. And if you're, even if you're not just working with the grant partner to tweak, adjust, further develop, double down on, um, what's working, what's not working. Um, it, it's not worth the time, the energy, the investment, because it takes a lot of, of all of that to, to do evaluation on a regular basis. And, and so, like I said, this needs to be a living, ongoing component of what you're doing. Um, I know there are more foundations out there who are either adding amounts to grant requests so that evaluation can be done or are encouraging applicants to add to the budget an evaluation component, which you know a, a lot of them hopefully will be funding. Um, we at the Jewish Foundation in Cincinnati have dedicated a certain percentage of our allocable dollars every year to having a, a side resource of evaluation effort dollars whether we use them internally or whether we help one of our grant partners who is seeking that kind of assistance, um, we have that resource available to us now. So um, it, it has to be an ongoing process and you can't just get the evaluation report and, and review it and then go, oh, that was really interesting and put it on the shelf. It's just, that's mm -hmm. a waste. Mm -hmm. So Wendy, I'm- you're... A little bit of a follow-up question to that. And then Wendy, sorry, I would love you to, to add more. It, do you right. think that evaluations like this and the partnerships that you develop and by thinking differently about avail evaluations and how you prepare make it less likely to sit on sit on that shelf that people are concerned about lots of research going to and why would that why do you think that might be yeah i i i think i mean tomorrow you, you sort of almost answered the question in your second <laughs> question right which is to say that you know, we believe and we've seen that, you know, these kinds of questions uh, being considered and discussed on the front end um, that would inform then evaluation planning, really that that sets the groundwork for uh, for ensuring that um, that the people who, you know, want and need to see this and who are sort of identified as audiences in advance are in fact in the process from the very beginning and, and it ensures that, you know, that this gets shared. Um, I, I, would, I would push one step beyond that. And, and this is something that, um, you know, one of the reasons that I, that I even started Rosal Consulting, frankly, was that, you know, I, I worked for an organization for a very long time, did a ton of evaluation work. Um, and a lot of it sat, sat on the shelf. It, it, it may have sat on the shelf, it might have gotten used, but it, but it was never anything that was shared or, uh, or really engaged in, you know, in sort of conversation. And um, I would go one step further even just to say that, um, again, when you think about the audiences for evaluation, like who else might, might, might this information be useful to? 
right? So it's it's amazing that grant makers and grant seekers or, or grant recipients can have these conversations um, and can and can consider, you know, and make meaning of, of what's been learned together, right? For the purpose of improvement, for the purpose of continuing to have these relationships be transparent and open and good conversation and good, uh, you know, colleagueship. Um, and, and to think about, you know, who else in your orbit, who else in your ecosystem might benefit from these learnings as well, right? And to, and to, and to say, you know, who can we share this with? And maybe you might want to share it in confidence. Maybe you might want to, you know, not post it up on your website, but, and, you know, we, we try to, as, as much as possible, we try to, you know, working with our clients in advance, we say to them, you know, is this something that we can post on our website? Is this something that you're willing to post on your website? Um, you know, is this something that you're willing to share with X or Y or Z? Sometimes a client, a new client comes to us and they want us to do a project and we say, you know, um, it'd be great if you talk to this person because we did a project like this for this organization, for this funder, for this, for this, you know, nonprofit um, in the past. And it would, you know, I think it would be helpful to you for some of those learnings. And we try to make those connections. Um, so, you know, definitely the sitting on the shelf thing is something that we are really, really, really makes us, gives us like a, you know, stomach ache when we, when we hear that. So um, it's a bummer because these resources for evaluation are really scarce. They're really, mm -hmm. really scarce, right? Because in the end of the day, right, funders want to support programs. They want to support people. They want to support interventions. Um, and, and the evaluation work is, is sometimes seen as like, you know, an add on or, a nice to have, but not essential to have. Um, so, you know, these resources really have to be used, you know, carefully. And if they're going to be expended, let's think about how more people can benefit from them rather than fewer. Uh, that's that's how I would, you know, respond to that. I also want to say that in, in the tool itself, there's a, there's a link to a piece on our website that's called um, Soft Skills for Hard Data. And it's about how you have the conversation around when the news isn't so good. <laughs> so that nobody sort of asked that question specifically, but I think that may be implied in part of this, like what happens if it gets shelved or, you know, sort of stashed away somewhere because maybe the, maybe the news wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, before I go on to the next question, Mike or Maria, anything to add to that? Okay. I'm very good. So another question that came is, is what's the relationship between these evaluation methods and processing and the practice of R&D within a grant seeking organization? Marie, that's, that's, yeah, a, that's, a, totally. that's a strike for you. Go ahead. It is. It is. Yeah. I mean, frankly, even I think from, from our perspective, ish, our, our team would say, um, you know, it, if you didn't have a particular funder in mind or you weren't quite ready with that step, it's still really critical to think about the all aspects of these questions, starting from your audiences, you know, your sphere of influence, your beneficiaries, who are you aiming to impact and influence with your work and, and why and what's driving them? That's that second question. What do they want to learn? What do they want to know through your work? By engaging with what you offer, what do they want to know, or what do they need to know? Um, and, and then again, I, I love that we were talking about that third question because I think that also is a great litmus test of you know were were we totally effective in either our learning process or in that sharing state that our you know audiences actually did act or were able to act, or if they didn't, how do we then? use that as a time for a conversation. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself because you were asking about the planning. So it, it, we think it's really important to, to think um, deeply about your beneficiaries and the surrounding spheres of influence, um, whether that's your partners, your funders, your board leadership otherwise. And again, what's, what's gonna drive them? How do you see them being impacted and influenced by your work? Um, if you put yourself in their point of view, what's important to them? What do they need? Mm -hmm. We would say it's critical. And I know we're just about at time. So I wanted to give each of you um, a few moments to, for, for a final thought and a final message to, to the other people, to the participants on this webinar. Mike, why don't we start with you? Sorry to, to pin it on you. 
Um, so I, I, I'm going to use the word trust again, because mm -hmm. one of the answers to how we answered, you know, how will the information be used had to do with uh, potentially making funding decisions. And there is always the likelihood that as you move through an evaluation process, that things aren't going to be good. And, and you know, I, I saw a few questions pop up uh, as we were talking earlier about like, do you share that information out? And, and yeah, nobody wants to kind of be the person out there that raises their hand and go, yeah, we really blew this one. It just totally blew up. But as a funder, it's really important to have the conversation with the grant partner early to say, you know, depending on the results, this could, you know, we're committed for three years, but at the end of three years, if, if we've done this evaluation and, and we've tried to answer everything that we're trying to answer, but we're still not seeing the results, we may at that point need to come up with like an off ramp funding model. So um, you just, it's really hard to have that conversation very early on, especially when everyone's enthusiastic and you're just really getting into it, but it's really important to have it early because that could be one of the results that you actually take away from this process. Yeah, that's great. And to have the transparency and the openness from the start yep. is important. Um, Marie? Yeah, I would say give yourself some practice. Um, ha start having these conversations now in the context, perhaps, of a program you're already doing and, and or, you know, just did. Maybe you, you've got some data or you don't. Um, I think to involve multiple um, levels of different people in these conversations, both, I think, within your team and then within your constituents, I love that Wendy brought up kind of a, a plus one to this process would be including beneficiaries early on. Do a small kind of focus group, if you will. Talk to a manager on your team. Ha have a director involved. Um, maybe one of your board leadership, uh, a constituent, a funder if you want to, but perhaps for some early conversations, you, you don't necessarily need to go there. Start practicing this. because These are muscles you have to build with, with every tool with every process, it's something that you have to practice so that it becomes familiar and comfortable um, and, and something that actually helps drive your work forward. So practice, don't be afraid, and yeah, include, include multiple people in the conversation because I think uh, you might be surprised what additional points of view can come up to the surface. Thank you. Right. It's always interesting how su surprising how when you actually start having these conversations, what points of view do come up, what you expect. And by just giving the space for those conversations, what really does come up. Thank you. And Wendy. Um, I think the last piece I've mentioned is the time dimension, right? When is the right time uh, for this yeah. work? And maybe that's a fifth question, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so be thinking about, um, you know, not just our resources available, but um, our human resources available. Um, is this the right time to be asking this kind of question? Do we need to wait a while uh, for something to manifest? You know, before you might see it. Um, those are those are some of those questions that that actually are are really critical. Um, you know, to consider as well in this process. So I just sort of throw that one in there at the end. Uh, in addition, because I think some of the questions I'm seeing in the chat, um, you know, sort of speak to that speak to that issue. So. Very good. Thank you, Wendy. And, and yeah, timing for with everything is so important, especially now. I'm sorry that we ran out of time. And I see that there's so many other questions and I'm sorry we didn't get there, but I hope that this was the beginning of a really good conversation and a new way to think and a new tool. I want to invite everybody to join us and I'll put this in the chat as well it's for our next granted webinar that's going to be on February 17th on the sustainability diagnostic tool, a new way to collaboratively measure impact. And I hope you can all attend that. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Wendy, for partnering with us and sharing your wisdom and your and your experiences and the and the tool with all of us. I will be sending out a follow-up email that will share this tool with everybody as well so that you can see how you can incorporate it into your work. And, um, and thank you all for participating today and looking forward to learning with you all again soon. Thank you.